Um, next will be Senator Langford, and after that, Senator Carper. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sun, I want to try to validate something. There's a letter that's in the public domain at this, uh, this point that's an eight-page letter that was written to Speaker Pelosi that uh, is attributed to you to try to explain the events of that day. Are you familiar with that letter in the public domain, and is it accurate? Yes, it is, sir. So in the letter itself, um, you, you describe several things in this and the details and the timeline on it. Uh, can you tell me why you wrote this letter to Speaker Pelosi? What was the purpose of the letter? I, I feel at the time uh, I resigned. I had lim limited communications with my uh, with my department. I know my department was getting ready to go and uh, testify at some of the initial uh, committee hearings. And I think that she had called for my resignation without full understanding of what we had prepared for, what we had gone through. Uh, that I, I think she uh, deserved to read, you know, firsthand what we had prepared for and what I, you know what I dealt with that that for that sixth. Okay, that's helpful. Uh, you had said in this, you talked several times about thousands of well-coordinated, well-equipped, violent criminals and described them with climbing gear and all the things that you've also testified here. You, you also mentioned this letter about the pipe bombs that were located, uh, that the first word would come at 1252 that a pipe bomb had been located at the Republican National Committee headquarters. How was that located? Uh, who, who found it and why was that particular moment the moment that it was found? I don't know why that was a particular moment that was found. Uh, I believe it was an employee of the Republican National Committee that had uh, located it in the rear of the building that had called it into Capitol Police headquarters. You, you had mentioned before that you thought this was part of the coordination, that there were several that were out there that would take away resources at that exact moment. But there's no way to know that they would find it at that exact moment. I'm glad they did find it. They found another one at the Democrat uh, headquarters as well at uh, 150, and you document that as well. But you had to send quite a few individuals to be able to go to the RNC and the DNC to be able to go deal with those explosives that were planted there. Is that correct? That, that is correct. And just for your information, the RNC uh, pipe bomb, that was one that was really run by uh, Capitol Police. The DNC Metropolitan ended up taking that and running that so we can run two concurrently. Uh, that resulted in the evacuation of two congressional buildings, the um, Cannon House Office building as well as one of the Library of Congress buildings. So it, it, it took extensive resources. So the assault in the Capitol is not what caused the evacuation of those buildings. The discovery of those pipe bombs is what caused the evacuation of those that buildings. That is correct, sir. Uh, there's been quite a bit of conversation today and quite a few members here that have talked about the National Guard and the length of time that it took to be able to go through the bureaucratic process to be able to get them deployed. I, 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 I do think that needs to be shortened, obviously, in, in a deployment structure and the complexity of the bureaucracy here. But it seems to be a misunderstanding on this dais of some individuals describing the National Guard as if they're the riot police that can automatically be called out. They're not, were you expecting them to be like a, a rapid response SWAT team at this point? What, what's a typical response from the National Guard to be able to call them out when they're not currently positioned? I, I believe the typical response once they are, they're approved is approximately two hours. Okay, but then the approval process is obviously multiple hours to do that or multiple days to do that. You had started that process several days before in making some requests. So that, that, that is correct. As far as the process, you know, my, my initial request was over to uh, Mr. Irving. It was actually an in-person request on the, uh, on the 4th. Uh, and it wasn't until the evening of the 4th that I talked to General Walker that he informed me that uh, if needed, because Mr. Stinger wanted me to ask him if they could lean forward, they could get 125. Right. If needed in a fairly, fairly quick fashion, once approved. So that's when, what led into January 6th when we made the initial request at 109. But that 125 individuals from the National Guard that were prepared to be able to move faster because they were in streets and different places doing traffic duty at that point, you had already been informed that the uh, city of Washington, D.C. and the mayor's office had made a request to DOD and DOD had approved it that none of them would be armed, none of them would be have heavy gear on, there would be no military vehicles that would be available to them, they had to use unmarked vans and other government vans, and there would be no helicopters that would be used. Those were prohibited that day for those 125 individuals that were already on the street. Is that correct? So just for a correction, at the time, no, I did not know that was the restrictions being placed on them. And uh, two, when I talked to General Walker the evening of uh, the 4th, which was Monday evening, the 125 he was going to give us were 125 that were doing COVID relief for the District of Columbia, not assigned to the traffic post. Okay. So the individuals that were assigned to traffic duty had no weapons, had no military vehicles moved, had no overhead uh, visual on anything. That had all been 
requested no from the city uh, of Washington, D.C. And then for the other individuals that could be assigned to you as a rapid force, those are folks that were currently doing COVID duty. So you had no SWAT team. This description is very interesting to me around this dais that people think that suddenly the National Guard just bursts in uh, and is ready to go on that. That's not what the National Guard is prepositioned to do. That, that is correct. Uh, anytime we've requested the National Guard, they've been in an unarmed uh, fashion. Uh, I was looking for them to help support the perimeter that we, were estab that we had established. Okay, there has been some concern that I've talked to some of the officers here, and there's obviously been some uh, conversation around this dais as well, about the rules of engagement and about training and authorization. Uh, there, there wasn't uh, training for what to do if a mass group actually comes through the door uh, and tries to burst through, whether it's an insurrection uh, type event, whether it's just a mob that's gone crazy and whatever, maybe or a protest that gets out of hand uh, to be able to burst through the door. There was no clarity for the officers inside the building on their rules of engagement once they actually came to the building. They literally, my impression is, had to make it up on their own and they determined their stand was going to be where the members and the staff were located. That was going to be their stand to start using lethal force. So I have a couple questions for that. At this point now, and I understand hindsight's 2020, is there a need for much greater, less than lethal force capability on officers at the time or available to officers at the time that they have less than lethal capabilities and clearer rules of engagement of what to do if you have a group of individuals come into the building unauthorized? So, uh, so just for a little clarification, we do train for people trying to get into the building. We don't train for, when I said, an insurrection of a thousands of people. Right. Uh, and our officers do have less lethal capability that they carry with them. With hindsight being what it is from January 6th, uh, absolutely, I think there needs to be uh, additional training, additional equipment uh, to consider this type of attack in the future. Well, the, the challenge is we all watched this summer. In fact, this committee at Homeland Security had a hearing on the assaults on a federal courthouse in Portland and went through and all of us saw for a month uh, individuals just attacked that courthouse day after day after day, and we saw the techniques that were used. Some of those same techniques were used by individuals that came in here. I'm not saying it was the same individuals, but some of those same techniques of trying to be able to work to the fence, to be able to find it, to be able to find a way to be able to attack officers. So the challenge is that we saw that, there, that this was rising, I guess, that people were watching on TV, uh, people attacking a federal institution all summer long. And uh, it is a follow-up that we're going to have to do in the days ahead of how to be able to get less than lethal capability and to find ways to be able to stop any kind of assault uh, of a number of individuals uh, to be able to come on the Capitol. So I appreciate your service. I appreciate very much the officers. Uh, that continue to be able to serve because they've not had a gap. They've not had a break uh, yeah. since that time period. And I know you still interact with them, at least I hope you do. Yes, and uh, I would in encourage you to pass on from us our gratitude. And we're all looking at this as a hindsight 2020 saying, why couldn't you read the tea leaves uh, at this particular scrap of intelligence that came in the night before? None of us saw it at this level. And uh, so we're grateful for the service they continue to do. And let's find the lessons we can learn. Thank you very much, sir. I know they appreciate your support as well as the support of Congress. They're, they're a hell of a police agency. Okay. Thank you, Senator Langford.